Okay, Christine, you're good to go. Copy that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. Um, my name is Christine Malajek, and I'm the Director of Risk Management for the AUMA. We'll just give uh, folks maybe one more minute to pop on the line here, and then we'll get started quite quickly. Uh, we understand and appreciate that you have a choice and uh, to select where you go for your education and are grateful and thankful that you've joined us here today for this uh, webinar with the AUMA. We also appreciate that there is a competing priority at 1 o'clock for some of you, the Director of Emergency Management call with the Alberta Emergency Management Agency. So to manage everyone's time and expectations, we're going to uh, get started here in a moment and we'll give uh, Ed uh, about 30 minutes, so 35 minutes for his presentation. We'll leave room for questions at the end and uh, sign off at uh, 12.45 to give those who have to be on the DEM call an opportunity to get themselves uh, ready for that particular phone call. I'll just give you another minute. Okay, is everybody logged on and they can see our slides and hear us loud and clear? All right, Kelly, can we advance the slide, please? Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thank you for joining us. I just have a uh, couple of housekeeping items. So we do welcome questions. This is a great opportunity for us to uh, exchange information and uh, get those burning questions out. So do use the chat box to submit your questions. And uh, we will try to answer the ones that are uh, relevant to today's conversation during the webinar. Uh, we'll try to answer them at points in the discussion where they seem to be timely and relevant. And we'll also take a few towards the end. Also, others that aren't really necessarily a good fit for this particular conversation, but do fit into the overall context of uh, COVID-19 and how municipalities uh, uh, need to respond. We can certainly put that in the parking lot and answer those after. Uh, also, just so you know, we'll be providing uh, resources uh, that we mentioned during this particular webinar, as well as a recording of this webinar after. So just being mindful of um, everyone's time, I believe that the mics are on mute and uh, the phones are on mute, and I just want to make sure everyone can hear us well. Yeah, I think some people can hear us. Some people, I think, are having issues with the sound, and it sounds like there might be a bit of a capacity problem with dialing in, um, which is not... <laughs> That, that unusual nowadays. I know they've been having a lot of capacity issues with conference calls all over now that everyone's working from home. So just ask you to be patient and keep trying to dial in. Uh, if not, again, the webinar is being recorded, so we'll distribute that to everyone after the webinar. Terrific. Thank you very much for that, Kelly. So we'll just advance to the next slide. Thank you so much. So um, today we're, we're taking an opportunity to have a, a conversation about where we are in the COVID-19 response. Ideally, where we'd like to be when we're talking about emergency management, business continuity, disaster recovery, and crisis management is uh, be in a 
particularly proactive state where we've taken a look at things like our business impact assessment, understanding the services we provide in the context of our municipality, have plans already developed, training and exercise them, and in the spirit of continuous improvement, uh, always reviewing them. But unfortunately, in some uh, cases, we're not necessarily in uh, a position where we, we have a tried and true uh, tested system in place. So what we have is where we are right now, and um, that's really is managing the emergency response and in the business continuity piece. So those are the two topics we're going to cover today. Uh, if there is interest to this, maybe what we could do is we could take a look at covering off some other pieces moving forward in as part of a web series as well. Uh, but today, uh, in, in response to um, the current need and the questions that we're receiving, we're going to cover off emergency um, uh, response as a, in the context of the Emergency Management Act and just some of the basics about business continuity. So next slide, please, Kelly. And so a lot of these questions have come up because um, decision makers like yourself, uh, council, mayors, CAOs, and other uh, members of administration need to make decisions. And you need to make really tough decisions as well. And these decisions aren't decisions that you make on a, on a regular and a current, uh, recurring basis. Um, so maybe just to reflect, one of my favorite slides that I use when uh, I talk about risk management or when I teach risk management at the university is, Anthony's triangle is that there's various levels of the organization where decisions are made. And at the most strategic level, uh, typically where council and uh, sits, is really those long-term strategic policy decisions where they carry out the vision of what the community uh, ought to look like and be shaped like very um, complex and non-routine decisions. And in the middle is where administration sits. And that's where the, those plans are subsequently and those visions are executed. And on, on the very lower, lowest level is where there's a lot of decisions that are made on a recurring basis. And that's where our operations teams uh, typically function on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's that management direction and that policy that's driven downward that helps to provide guidance throughout the organization. But that information flow that goes out that uh, creates a continuous improvement cycle and also keeps everybody well informed of what uh, is going on within our municipalities. This cer certainly is a great model for our day-to-day uh, -day operations, but also as well during this uh, uh, exceptional circumstance that we have right now. With that being said, um, just go to the next slide, please, Kelly. Okay. I'd like to just cover off the objectives for today. So again, just on a very high level, looking at uh, what the elected officials' obligations are under the NGA and the Emergency Management Act, as well as the local authorities' emergency management regulation. Um, the elected officials' role before and during an emergency slash crisis, and the continuity of operations. Next slide, please. Okay. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, our, our team today on the phone. Uh, Kelly Santa Rosa, our wonderful senior policy analyst with the AUMA. She's helping uh, with moderation and with advancing slides because unfortunately I couldn't get it into presenter mode. Uh, again, my name is Christine Malajek and I'm the Director of Risk Management for the AUMA. But I'd love to introduce to you a, um, a trusted and uh, wonderful colleague of mine, Ed Wedland. Uh, he's a principal of his own, at his own consultancy, uh, WCEM Inc. And um, I've worked with Ed in the past and uh, love his perspective on things. And he's here to help provide you with some uh, simple and uh, quick information for you to kind of get a sense of uh, where um, your decision making lies right now in, with respect to the MGA and the Emergency Management Act. So with that, I'll pass it on to Ed. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to blast through this. Uh, there's a number of things I'd like to cover, uh, and I really want to hear some of the, the questions that you have. What we're really focused on doing is, is trying to put things in perspective, try to help you during a really tough time. Uh, we, in Alberta, we are certainly no, um, we're, we're no um, stranger to lots of uh, disasters. There we go. Um, Pine Lake Tornado 2000, Slave Lake Wildfires 2011, Flooding 2013, Wood Buffalo Wildfire 2016, and even this past year, <clears throat> the Alberta Wildfires. Those natural occurring types of disasters, we seem to be getting uh, 
a lot better at dealing with. When it comes to dealing with infectious diseases, that's something we really don't have a lot of experience. If you think back to those of you that are old enough, uh, think back to SARS in 2003. Uh, I, I remember going to the Abu Dhabi airport uh, and having somebody with a temperature probe aiming at my forehead as I was just uh, coming off the plane. First time I was really exposed to something like this. Um, and then we had H1N1 in 2009. But, you know, for most Albertans, it really didn't have much of an impact. <clears throat> What it did do, it, it, it acted as a catalyst for us to start looking at what kind of continuity plans do we need to have in place? Do we need, do we need a standalone pandemic plan? <clears throat> and a number of organizations uh, moved forward and did start to develop a pandemic plans. The, the problem with the COVID-19 pandemic is our pandemic plans are not structured to deal with an event like this, or perhaps the response that's being taken by the World Health Organization, our own federal government, and provincial governments. <clears throat> I can tell you one thing, uh, stocking up on toilet paper is not the answer for this. Um, the challenge with infectious diseases are they're essentially invisible, and we really don't have a lot of experience in dealing with them. So whereas flooding, fires, those are easy to see, we can see the impact zone, but for many of us, who might actually be infected is very difficult to tell. Even right now, if we look at the number of reported cases of COVID-19, does that really tell us how expansive the problem really is? Are we sure that there are people within our communities that don't have COVID-19? If you have mild symptoms, you may just stay at home. In fact, I'm just at the tail end of my own self-isolation uh, because I had a cold. A lot of the symptoms were very similar to COVID-19. But on the other hand, someone else may have COVID-19, and we would be none the wiser. So this is the kind of, I guess, crisis that really makes you think. We really need to be prepared to deal with the invisible. We aren't sure whether or not it's in our communities. We, th we may think it's not, but we're really not sure. And, and that really necessitates us to really take a good hard look at what do we need to do to really keep our communities. <clears throat> a number of you have possibly opened emergency coordination centers. Several of you have uh, declared a state of local emergency. Um, and some of you have perhaps not done any of that. And, and maybe the reason is because really the impact has been very minimal. And perhaps there's nothing wrong with them. But we're going to give you some, some things to think about and some approaches on how we can deal with this current crisis and how we might be able to get out of it. I don't have the solution how to get out of it, but what are some of the things perhaps that we need to do to get out of this and hopefully return to some sense of normalcy before too long? All right, so the next slide, uh, I think some of you may have seen this before. <clears throat> really, public safety is our common purpose. If you look at all of the various pieces on the periphery here, uh, our community, big or small, our government of Alberta ministries, the, uh, the non-government organizations, um, other agencies and boards, federal, provincial, territorial uh, organizations, um, we're all in this together. What this is really forcing us to do is to be highly reactive. We are not used to dealing with this kind of situation. And every day there seems to be new information that requires us possibly to change our approach. And I frankly don't think it's really going to change very much at all. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is just briefly cover some of the uh, legislative responsibilities for elected officials. So you've got really uh, a couple of pieces of legislation that really guide uh, your whole existence, we'll say. So the Municipal Government Act and the Emergency Management Act, they work in conjunction to provide the legislative framework for elected officials in managing emergencies. Um, I am by no means an expert on legislation. I do my best to interpret them, um, but from what they been led to understand and what I've been told, uh, the NGA does outline the rules and rules for good local government, including a brief note on dealing with emergencies. 
The Emergency Management Act takes this a little bit further, specifically with how the municipality will organize for emergencies and disasters, as well as providing extraordinary powers to deal with emergency events. <clears throat> What's interesting, though, is everything is really focused on emergencies. And when we look at something like a pandemic, does it really fill that whole definition of an emergency? Or is it really a, a, an issue that is affecting our continuity, our ability to continue to do the things that we would like to in life for businesses to conduct? It's really impacting our continuity of operations. So yes, there are emergency actions we have to take to stop the spread, but really most of us are challenged with how are we gonna continue to provide essential services throughout this whole thing? <clears throat> and that's some of the things that we're going to discuss in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> All right, so if we look at the, uh, the MGA, <clears throat> really right at the front, uh, section three, the purpose of municipalities to develop and maintain self and viable communities, to work co collaboratively with neighboring municipalities and to plan, del deliver and fund intermunicipal services. <clears throat> so absolutely crucial here. Now, section, uh, uh, sorry, bylaws, uh, section seven, the, the council may pass bylaws for municipal purposes respecting the following matters, safety, health, and welfare of people and the protection, and pro protection of people and property. And there's certainly a, a number of other things in there. And as we go into the Emergency Management Act and the local authority emergency management regulation, we really see that becoming an essential piece <clears throat> And it really does define what is the role of the various pieces that allow us to provide uh, an emergency response and management capability and protect and serve our communities. <clears throat> now, Section 551 uh, does provide uh, uh, guidance in that it says, in an emergency, a municipality may take whatever actions or measures are necessary to eliminate the emergency. Fairly broad, and when you think about it, uh, essentially right from the get-go, it gives fire and police the powers to deal with emergencies on a day-to-day -day basis. The fire department doesn't need a warrant to enter a burning building, and police may forcibly remove people if they are at risk. No state of local emergency is required to be declared in, in these particular cases because those are the authorities that they've been delegated. <clears throat> it does also mean that the these uh, the state of local emergency powers at, at, at an, any emergency scene <clears throat> are provided to elected officials. It doesn't mean we have to go and, and, and actually declare a state of local emergency for these things. This power by law immediately goes to the emergency management agency to carry out the responsibilities of that local authority and to the director of emergency management. So the elected officials get statutory authority, but the emergency services actually do the actions. <clears throat> All right, if we look at the Emergency Management Act, <clears throat> so section key, if, if there was a section of the Emergency Management Act that uh, I would want you to look at, it, it's section 11, absolutely. That and probably 18 and 19. But it is the key to emergency management in Alberta. And it specifically says what must be done by a local authority. So 11A, a local authority shall at all times be responsible for the direction and control of the local authority's emergency response. So the local authority is responsible for the direction and control, but the emergency management agency exercises those powers and duties under this act. <clears throat> And it does say that a local, a local authority shall appoint an emergency advisory committee consisting of a member or members of the local authority. And that must be done by bylaw. 11.2, <clears throat> the local authority shall maintain an emergency management agency to act as an agent of the local authority in exercising the local authority's powers and duties under this act. So once again, uh, you have the statutory authority the Emergency Management Agency's role is actually to develop the plans and implement those plans. <clears throat> Let's move on to the next slide. So under the Local Authority Emergency Management Regulation, which is fairly new as, as I'm sure you're all aware, it, a couple of key areas in there. 
emergency advisory committees. They must be established by bylaw, and it does include what the purpose of that committee is, the membership. It provides, uh, should provide role in providing guidance and direction to the emergency management agency. <coughs> and it should include establishing procedures when declaring a state of local emergency. Some of you have been involved in declaring a state of local emergency in the past, others have not, but it, clearly a state of local emergency is, a, is an important tool that is available to you, but it should be used for the right reasons. And we're gonna talk about the state of local emergency uh, a little bit later in the presentation. <clears throat> the other thing is the, uh, the bylaw needs to define what is the makeup of your committee, right? So your advisory committee is primarily going to be your elected officials, uh, your DEM will sit as part of that advisory committee because your DEM is going to be the one who's actually providing you updates what the agency is actually doing. <laughs> so um, for the emergency management agency under 3.1, it must be established by bylaw and it includes the appointment of a director of emergency management and that the agency is responsible for the administration of the local authorities emergency management program. So once again, this says, your DEM needs to be established. This is what the responsibilities of the, the DEM are. <clears throat> and it also says that the DEM is actually responsible along with the agency for the administration of the local authorities emergency management program. So what does that mean? Prepare and coordinate emergency plans and programs for the municipality. Implement a command and control coordination system consistent with what the managing director of the Alberta Emergency Management Agency uh, has uh, um, determined. <clears throat> so in this case, the incident command system. Now your agency could also be an agent of more than one local authority. If you happen to be part of a regional emergency management program, or it could be, you know, you could have a, you could have a regional service commission. <clears throat> The other thing this act talks about is the training requirements. And there is a clear requirement for all participants <laughs> to have training. If you are an elected official, you also need to complete specific training. You need to do the municipal elected officials uh, training program. Uh, directors of emergency management have a lot more training that they have to undergo, such as basic emergency management, incident command system one, two, and 300 levels, and the DEM course. All other municipal staff with assigned emergency management responsibilities have to have at least the basic emergency management course and ICS 100. So the regulation is fairly specific on what you actually have to do. So when we look at the, the Municipal Governance Act, the Emergency Management Act, and the Local Authority Emergency Management Regulation, it's fairly clear in defining what the various elements are and where the authorities lie and who actually has responsibility for implementing. <clears throat> so before we go on to, uh, on to the next part, which is the role of elected officials before an emergency crisis, uh, is there any specific question about what we just talked about? I know it's not the most exciting stuff, but it's important that, <clears throat> sorry, it's important you have a good understanding of uh, so there's a question from Ren. Um, he says, we're a small summer village without any businesses or stores in the village. We have a small hall we do not rent out and a playground we have already closed. What would be the purpose of declaring a state of local emergency in our village? Okay, so um, can we defer that question till um, after we talk about the soul? We're, we're going to talk about that in about about 10 minutes, if that's all right? Yep, okay, for sure. All right, I think there's, uh, there is another question. Where do, you, where do you find a list of the training requirements for staff and for the DEM? So that should be provided by AEMA. You can certainly go to your field officer. They would have that information. I would put them as the first point of contact. Uh, and you can also find that information would be available through the AEMA website. All right, I'm going to move on then. So role of elected officials before an emergency or a crisis. So what is it that we expect you to do? One is 
Understand your legal responsibilities and your authority regarding a rule, your legal powers, such as declaring a state of local emergency. Uh, you should have an appreciation of the municipal emergency management plan. You don't need to know it like the back of your hand, but you should have a good understanding about what's in there and really what are the risks or the vulnerabilities to specific types of events or incidents that your particular community might have to deal with. Uh, you should understand how your community is positioned to provide continuity of essential services. So business continuity plans. And for the most part, when we look at all this legislation, it really doesn't make any specific reference to continuity plans. Some of you, I understand, probably have <clears throat> some pretty well-defined uh, continuity plans. Others, I would venture to guess, probably have nothing at this time. And this is one of those things, this is one of those areas where you may be struggling right now because what we're really focused on, besides protecting people, is how can we continue to provide essential services? And we'll talk about that a little bit further. And certainly, what are the procedures for elected officials to be notified? What I would like you to do, I'd like you to be, have a good understanding of what are the hazards and the risks for your community. You should have a good understanding of what the bylaw is. Go through it with your den. Uh, I don't expect you to ensure requirements of the Emergency Management Act are being met, but if you have a good understanding of the expectations, I think that will help you as a group. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on to the next slide. Oops, sorry, went, went too far. Uh, the role of elected officials during an emergency or crisis. So do we want you to come bolting into the Emergency Coordination Center uh, and getting your updates? No, there is actually an approach for going through this. It's the responsibility of the DEM to, and the agency to ensure that you get situational updates, regular updates, and this is a matter of really coordinating with the DEM as to when those updates would take place. <clears throat> If we need to, yes, we will come to you with a recommendation about uh, declaring a state of local emergency. There are forms that exist for those things. They have to be, uh, we have to publish the fact that we're going to do these. Um, we may have to ex approve extraordinary expenditures. So in your particular community, does your DEM have carte blanche for spending or is there a fiscal a financial limit? Uh, and if we, possibly have to go beyond that, we would have to get approval. Sounds fairly reasonable. Uh, there may be needs to identify uh, policy needs or options to help us meet uh, the needs of the situation. And I'm sure that's probably happened in some areas. Um, we want you to participate in the decision making regarding implementation of measures to enable continuity of essential services. So whereas administration is, should be very much focused on the plans, you are going to have a role to play in this, and certainly a role in actually communicating it. One of the biggest concerns <clears throat> is, <clears throat> excuse me, is the lack of information, which seems kind of odd because we, right now we're getting bombarded with information about COVID-19 and the coronavirus. <clears throat> uh, I mean, you could spend 24 hours a day just listening to the various news channels if you wanted to. But what is important is your community needs to hear from you what are you doing to continue to provide essential services. What services are available? Are we going to do things differently? And that's really where this whole continuity of operations comes into play. But what I'd like to see is I'd like to see every community website, and I'm sure you all have a website, is probably the simplest mechanism we can use. And it's only one of the mechanisms, but the one that we should be using to provide regular updates. And whether or not you like our premier, the fact that he's been doing regular updates every day is important. And I'd like to see us doing the same thing with our communities because they want to hear from our community leaders. <clears throat> So, state of local emergency. Well, recent legislation uh, has actually made it easier for a state of local emergency and a state of emergency to coexist. Uh, and what does it do? It provides you as the local authority, um, it gives you authority to take extraordinary actions to deal with the situation. 
Normally, a state of local emergency is seven days. It can be renewed or it can be terminated. <laughs> and it is not required uh, to activate emergency plans, obtain disaster relief, or government funding. Really, the reason you're doing this is to really to ensure you protect and have safe communities. <clears throat> what are some of those? Um, what are some of those uh, powers that you might actually have? You can control or prohibit travel, uh, so you can impose curfews. Uh, you can acquire or use personal property, so resources or equipment. You could procure or fix prices for services and resources. So if somebody happens to be selling Lysol wipes at $30 a container, right, you can actually uh, stop that. <clears throat> uh, you, can, you may need to cause the evacuation of persons, livestock, or property. Um, authorized conscription of persons needed to meet an emergency. Uh, provide for the restoration of essential facilities and the distribution of essential supplies. And provide, maintain, and coordinate emergency medical, welfare, and other essential services. <clears throat> so those are some of, the, well, some if not most of the things you can actually do. Uh, but you can, you can certainly improvise. The idea of using hotels or motels to act as shelters uh, to give you city-wide ranging authority to enforce provisions and any new ones that may be required to ensure that your community is safe and secure. Uh, you may need to provide Authorize entry into buildings without a warrant. So an interesting case might be where you have people um, who may have been exposed to, exposed to COVID-19 who are not self-isolating. Now, let's say they go back into their home, right? But we can actually have our law enforcement actually under the state of local emergency, they can go right in there and get those people who are potentially exposing other people to this disease. Right, so that's kind of a thing that you can actually do. It's not a soul is not something that should be used just because it say it, it sounds sounds pretty interesting, or you know, just because everybody else is doing it. it should be actually done for a purpose. <laughs> so, any any questions uh, regarding uh, regarding a soul? Ed, there was the one earlier on from uh, Ren. So we are a small summer village without any businesses, stores in our village. We have a small hall. We do not rent out. And a playground. We are already closed. Um, what would be the purpose of declaring a soul in our village? I don't know if there would be a purpose for declaring a soul. <clears throat> if you feel that you've taken all the measures to ensure that your community is safe and protected, then... Are, are you having to exercise any one of these powers? If you feel that you don't have to, then I, I would say you probably don't need a soul at this time. Also as well, uh, there was a question regarding um, if you could elaborate a little bit more on law enforcement being able to uh, use the soul to sequester people in hotels. Yeah, I, I wasn't thinking of necessarily sequestering them, um, but yeah, let me take a look. <clears throat> and I'll use a large city as an example. So the city of Edmonton is actually using the Expo Center uh, to house um, people who are currently homeless, right? And there's going to be some people who may have been exposed to COVID-19, others who may show, so, show some symptoms. So they are actually, you know, they're protecting our vulnerable population by actually using the Expo Center. The, the soul actually has made it a lot easier for them to do this uh, than if they didn't have a soul. Does that help? We got an affirmative. Okay, and one last question, then we'll move on uh, in the interest of time. So we have a bit of a hybrid situation. Our ECC was activated two weeks ago Monday, but we have not declared a soul. Many staff are working from home, and ECC staff will switch out shift two on Monday. We're focusing on business continuity. My question is, with a soul not declared, does the decision-making authority remain with the CAO or DEM? 
Uh, it's it's you've got your ECC activated. So however you've got that structured, if the ECC being activated, the DEM is responsible for that. So I would say uh, the DEM. However, we got to work together. Perfect. Uh, in the interest of time, there's a uh, one more question here. With the province finally providing direction around enforcement, enforcing the health order, why would a municipality want to have a sole or direct law enforcement? So I guess that um, you know that is a good question. Mm -hmm. So in this particular mm -hmm. case here, the CMO I think does provide that direction and guidance through. Uh, their authority and have put uh, some guidance out right now. Uh, we can send a link after uh, as to what they're presently enforcing and it's typically gatherings over uh, 50 and people who aren't self-quarantining after travel. Uh, and there is, a self -report there is a reporting portal on the AHS website and uh, health inspectors are actually managing that part of uh, the enforcement. Okay. Well, I think that was a good answer, Christine. Okay, I'm sure there'll be more questions. We're going to move forward because we're going to rapidly run out of time here. So just on emergency coordination centers, the interaction between elected officials and those people who have a functional responsibility in the ECC. So it's really up to the DEM to keep elected officials apprised of the situation, <clears throat> not only of the status, but certainly of what our plans are. Uh, we don't recommend elected officials spend a lot of time in the ECC. I think it's great to have them brought in by the DEM, provide words of encouragement, support, that sort of stuff, actually see what actually is going on. I hate to say it, it's almost a little bit more like a, a bit of a tour, right? But certainly uh, it, it's okay to actually provide that kind of support. But you got to remember that these are people who have been involved in a lot of assessment of what's going on, a lot of decision making. And if you're not in there and you start to get engaged or there's this, if people believe that by you being present, you now perhaps might have a role. It can be a little bit confusing to people, all right? So we do encourage you to, uh, to, to, to come by sort of, you know, through the dam, <clears throat> but uh, the dam is responsible for making sure that you are kept adequately updated as far as what's going on. <clears throat> Your role as elected officials, deal with those policy issues, declare a soul if you need it, and there's going to be times we need you to be the spokesperson. You need to talk to the constituents. Uh, so we have information officers in the ECCs uh, who will be working with you. But a big part of that is at the right time, having the right person to communicate the information that we want to get out to our stakeholders. That's where we see a key role of our elected officials. <clears throat> And we want, we, we really want to make sure that people also understand, you know, when we have emergencies, whether it's not, whether it's something like this, or uh, I don't want to say standard, but let's, let's say we have a wildfire type situation. Not everything stops. The business of government needs to continue. The business of providing essential services needs to continue. And we need to try to do that as much as we can. We can't always do it, but we certainly want to strive for doing that. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to switch over to talking about continuity of operations. <clears throat> now, if you look at this slide, <clears throat> the umbrella slide, <clears throat> we look at business continuity management as something as the umbrella for all of these various pieces. If you think back to Christine's slide earlier on about the incident event and life cycle, <clears throat> sorry, we made reference to a number of different types of plans. There was business continuity plans, there was emergency management plans, perhaps crisis plans, there's in, uh, information technology disaster recovery plans. So really, if we think of continuity management as the umbrella that really covers everything, right? So dependent on the kind of incident we're going to deal with, we may have, we have information technology issues. We may have some continuity type issues. This example shows security. It may not be applicable uh, for your particular uh, um, situation. Maybe it's supply chain, right? Um, but what we tend to do is we tend to make a number of different plans, right? And then we really it's a matter of these plans need to be synced. What we want to talk a little bit more about is business continuity. 
So if we look at that, if we look at the life cycle uh, of a business continuity plan, there's really five phases. We identify what are, what are our risks. Also list what are our essential services. We analyze, we do some sort of business impact analysis to really understand what the impact is of various types of scenarios impacting what our key business processes are. Design, so if something does happen, we need to have some sort of a strategy on how we're going to deal with it. <clears throat> so we develop, a, uh, we establish a strategy, we want to develop that a little bit further, so we actually develop a whole business continuity plan and then, of course, we're going to train, test, and we're going to measure. So not that different from what we do from an emergency management plan, really from the last two pieces, but the first three tend to be uh, fairly different. The first question you need to ask yourself is, what is it that we do which we need to keep doing immediately after a disruption event? So whether that's a fire, like a wildfire, or flooding, a pandemic, we need to be thinking, what are those things we need to be able to continue to provide? What are those essential services? <clears throat> and so what are these key elements of a business continuity plan? I'm going to briefly cover some of these things. Right? Conduct a hazard and risk assessment. So many of you have done that either through an existing hazard risk and vulnerability assessment or a hazard inventory and uh, risk assessment. We want to update those to define those non-emergency events that could impact our business processes. <clears throat> Number two is we want to list our essential services. What are our business processes? So we need to make a list of these, right? And um, so you should, you should be pretty clear on what are these, and you, you can call them essential services. What are these essential services that we pro provide? And then look at it and say, hey, which of these are critical? Which can we only sort of be, not be able to provide for up to 24 hours? Which ones are vital that we need to have back within 72 hours? Which ones do we consider necessary? But you know what? If we didn't do them for two weeks, we'd still be okay. And which of those that are desired? And those are anything really longer than two weeks. Now, that is a scale that, you know, um, I wouldn't say it's a standard, but it's a scale that is often used. So we really need to get a sense of that. And what this doesn't mean is this isn't about people telling people, hey, what you do is not important. It's identifying what are those business processes that we feel that we need to provide to those people who rely on us. <clears throat> What's the third piece? Come on, third piece. Uh, we need to complete a business impact analysis for each process. So every process you identify, you, you should be looking, you should be asking a number of questions. And it really comes down to resource needs and vulnerabilities, right? Do and, you know, and what are our dependencies? Because we really need to understand those dependencies. And we all say we all, we all rely on information technology. And if we come up with our own little plans and we don't engage our IT uh, support team, what we're going to find is we've, we're all asking for the same thing, and chances are IT is not going to be able to deliver all of that. So we really need to have a good understanding of what those dependencies are. Uh, this slide is very useful in uh, helping you look at the five different resource uh, areas, processes, people, providers, premises, and profile. <clears throat> and you should be able to Go in here, ask these questions for every process. And ideally what you would do is you would take this and you'd have a blank version and you would fill in every block. And this, this BIA actually give, should be able to give you a good sense of those areas uh, where you've got dependencies, where you may have some issues. Like, you need to understand what's the minimum staffing you can, actually, you can actually have to carry out certain business processes. Who are your priority suppliers? Are there alternatives? So I would encourage you to actually have your organizations go through something like this. Number four, prepare a strategy worksheet for each business process. So something like this, one, uh, probably a one-sheet, maybe two if you need more, that really encapsulates 
really what is the business function, what's the risk scenarios, what's our business impact, what our proactive strategy would be, and what our reactive strategy would be. All right? All right, and I know there's a, a lot of information we've covered. Um, some of things going forward, uh, challenges, challenges and opportunities, pandemic assumptions. 40 to 60% of workforce may not be available. And that number could change dramatically. Physical distancing is now part of what we do. Is it maybe a new normal? Personal protective equipment needs. We know there's a great need. The great thing is what's happening is we're seeing other industries who are helping us meet those supply needs. And the other thing about pandemics, will there be a second or a third wave? Uh, how do we keep our people safe? Do we have the broadband capability to be able to have everybody work remotely? Uh, what are our flexible work options? <clears throat> and business resumption planning. So some of you are concerned about, hey, this is where we're at. I don't know what we can do anymore. But remember, at some time, we're going to have to plan for getting back to normal, that business res resumption planning. So we need a plan on how we can safely get back to normal. So we can already start thinking about those sorts of things right now. What are the expectations of the public? The other thing is we need to be excellent in communicating to businesses and your constituents. What about mental health needs of your staff? Have we considered that? What are our, what are our HR policies? How do they affect what we're currently dealing with? What about security and maintaining empty and closed facilities? Uh, is this now the time that we should be decontaminating some of these facilities? Can we repurpose people and resources? And really, can we maximize our intermunicipal cooperation to be able to provide services that perhaps alone we may not be able to do, but if we were able to pool what resources we had, could we possibly provide more than we currently do? Uh, there is one last uh, slide, things, considerations for increasing your, your re resilience. We put in a number of things here for you to think about uh, when it comes to those five resource type areas. Um, I know it's, it's like drinking out of a fire hose right now, but we really, really think, you know, now is the time. Even if you don't have a continuity plan or a pandemic plan, there's still a lot you can do because we don't know if we're going to have a second wave. So we might have this low, we might come back to some sense of normal, and then it's going to hit us again. And how are we going to get back to normal? So having plans in place to do that will certainly make your life a lot easier. We have to be nimble because we know that things can change very dramatically. All right, I know we're, we're over the time. Uh, if you're still there, um, we can certainly, I can certainly take some questions. So I think one of the uh, some of the biggest burning questions are, um, you know, if we're managing the emergency and there really isn't much more to do, we don't have a lot of um, people in our community who have been reported and confirmed. Uh, do we need to do anything else at this time? And um, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are, Ed, but this is maybe a good hurry up and wait time. So while uh, we're being incredibly mindful of the chief medical officer's recommendations for social distancing and for um, maintaining each other's uh, health and safety, this might be a good opportunity to look at your emergency plans, your business continuity, and consider business resumption. So even though you might not necessarily have uh, too much uh, going on in your municipality with respect to COVID, there's still an opportunity just to review your plans in the spirit of continuous improvement and operational excellence. Um, here's another one. As a small village, we contract all of our business services, CAO services, garbage collection, grass cutting, maintenance, snow removal, etc. What should we be asking our contractors regarding continuity planning? So third party risk. Yeah, and you know what? That's a good question because when you think about it, if you are outsourcing anything, you should be asking your contractor, what's your continuity plan? Because no different than us, they need to have their own continuity plans. So having a good understanding of how they plan to deal with emergency uh, or, or continuity type issues is really important. Um, in some cases, organizations will actually have their, their um, contractors put that within their, within their contract language. 
terrific. Now, in the interest of time, um, what we're going to do is just remind everybody that uh, you know, continue to add questions to the chat box. The chat box will uh, pull after and do our best to do any sort of follow-up. The uh, documents that Ed referenced in today's presentation, so we've got a really quick uh, business impact assessment and another worksheet. Those are currently available on the AUMA uh, COVID website. Those came directly from the Alberta Emergency Management Agency and are actually a great consistent template to use uh, within our municipalities. Um, also as well, just a, a quick reminder that you know, in the spirit of, of uh, collaboration with other municipalities, don't be afraid to reach out and uh, see what others are doing and uh, just check your neighbors, see if they're okay and see if there's any material that you guys want to share or resources that you guys can plan to share uh, if need be. Uh, we'll also be providing these slides uh, and a copy of the recording uh, shortly. We're going to try to get that up on our website and at the very least make sure that we email uh, the link out to everybody. Um, because I don't have uh, the ability to advance the slide. Kelly, can you advance the slide? Yeah. Perfect. So um, thank you again to Ed for joining us today. Um, I super appreciate the time that you've taken to join us and have always enjoyed uh, working with you over time. So thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. Oops. Oops. Sorry, I think I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> No problem. So if I could just go, uh, so the next step, so the AUMA is going to continue to provide updates uh, from uh, the provincial government. We're going to be adding it to our AUMA COVID website. And also as well, if you haven't already subscribed to our Digest newsletter, please do so. We're sending out uh, ongoing and uh, communication and updates and links to valuable resources. But also as well, follow us on social media. We tend to have a really great uh, uh, and timely team in our communications department who send out um, uh, news releases and uh, updated information. And stay tuned. Um, you know, if you like this uh, particular webinar, maybe we could take a look at an Ask, Ask the Expert series in the future. I'll just get you to advance the slide. And also as well, we appreciate that um, we're here to serve, and we're here to serve our communities, and we're people, and this is a people business. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that the people that we serve, that, that uh, work with us are okay. And so AUMA is partnered with uh, AMSA, uh, the CSSE, and uh, Howitt Consulting to provide uh, a link to a weekly um, mental fitness um, uh, workshop every Tuesday at 10 a.m. So uh, we've provided the link here, and again, we'll be sending this out to you. Um, a wonderful series, and Dr. Howe is amazing. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? So if you have any other additional questions, uh, certainly you can reach out to myself, uh, Christine Malajek, and also our wonderful Rachel DeVos. She's our Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy, so she would be able to answer a lot of these wonderful questions that you have today regarding uh, legislate, legislative uh, updates through municipal affairs or you know, the continuity of governance itself. And I'm happy to answer any sort of business continuity uh, questions that you have as well. We'll go to the next one. Perfect, and we know that there's a long road ahead, um, and we thank you so very much for all the work that you're doing to help your municipalities and those who live there, and thank you so much. Again, you have a choice as to uh, which webinars and which education that you attend, and we're so grateful that you took the time to join us today. And with that, we'll wrap today's uh, session up. We'll get the information out as soon as we can, and thank you so much for your time.